I would love to welcome everyone to tonight's core volunteer training. It's on explaining the science of climate change and we're honored to have our very own Dr. Sandy Kirtland Turner with us tonight. And so without further ado, let's jump right in and I'll have a chance to introduce Sandy and then overview kind of our learning goals for the evening before turning it over to her. So uh, Dr. Kirtland Turner is on the line tonight. She's been an assistant professor of paleoclimate and paleooceanography at the Department of Earth Sciences at the University of California, Riverside since 2015. She's previously been a National Science Foundation International Research Fellow based at the University of Bristol at the UK and has her doctorate from Scripps Institution of Oceanography uh, back in 2012 and has been involved with CCL since it practically started back in 2008 uh, one of the very first volunteers actually out in California and is now on the board of directors with Citizens Climate Education. So we're incredibly honored to have you on the phone tonight, Sandy, and thank you so much for joining us. Uh, a quick review before uh, we begin, uh, just the learning goals for tonight. Uh, there are fourfold. We're hoping after listening to tonight's lesson, attendees should be able to understand the natural carbon cycle, as well as the basic concepts behind climate change, such as carbon dioxide trapping heat, the concentration of carbon dioxide rising in the atmosphere and human contributions driving this rise. We also really want to uplift and highlight the importance of the scientific method and peer review process in that whole scientific discovery and then also implement these best practices in communicating research and findings about climate science with our other community members and then really also take action to find out more information and connect with climate scientists local to your own group or to track down any questions you might have. And in order to best do that, it's a six-fold agenda tonight. We're gonna talk quickly about the carbon cycle and then jump into the anthropogenic links to that, as well as the scientific method and peer review, as we've said. And then we're gonna talk about what we can do about it and then have a chance for a more extended Q&A discussion and then close with partner action plans like we always do for core volunteer training to really engage you with this content and help you become more expert in your own interest areas. So without further ado, I'll turn it over to you, Sandy, and we're honored to have you on the line tonight. Thank you all for being on the call and uh, let's give it up to Dr. Kirtland Turner. Great, so I always like to begin talking to everybody about climate change with my personal motivation. Um, for working on this issue because I think that it's this is my example of how it's best to engage anyone you speak to start out with your own personal story rather than getting immediately into the technical or or nitty-gritty details um, and so my personal story I like to think of as beginning in about 2009 when I was a PhD student at Scripps and I got the incredible opportunity to travel to the Antarctic Peninsula and that really put into context for me what I was studying in my classes at the time, because this is an incredibly beautiful environment. Here's the photo here. And it is one of the places most dramatically at risk by climate change. So we'll talk about this in a bit, but it turns out that due to global warming, as our planet has its temperature rise, the poles actually experience a greater and more rapid temperature rise. And so we are threatened by losing ice um, at the high latitudes more rapidly than we would see impacts of climate change, the low latitudes. And if we put that into, you know, kind of context of how we would, why would we would care living where we do, if we melt the Antarctic continent, for example, that's 60 meters of sea level rise that's locked up in those ice sheets. So on the opposite side of the globe in the Northern hemisphere, it turns out that the Arctic region is actually warming faster already than anywhere else on earth. We've already seen major disappearance of Arctic sea ice, um, particularly with the summer extent getting so low that we can send ships um, crossing around the, the north of the uh, North American continent, for instance, and around Europe. And all of this ice that melts, if it's sitting on land, so in Greenland, for instance, Antarctica itself contributes to sea level rise, as I said, but also when we melt ice on land that's covering areas where there was previously a lot of vegetation, we can actually release additional greenhouse gases into the atmosphere and actually accelerate the pace of climate change. So there are a number of reasons that we're concerned about these sorts of fragile areas. And so that's kind of my personal concern and motivated by that wonderful trip I took. 
So I'd like to go through a bit of background, what we know about climate change, what we know about carbon dioxide in particular as a greenhouse gas, um, and then kind of move on with some impacts. So as to begin, the most fundamental thing to remember is that we produce carbon dioxide gas by combustion of fossil fuels. And so that includes coal, oil, natural gas. Those are all fuels derived from the remains of once living organisms. Thanks. And the remains of organisms living in the ocean in the case of, of oil and much natural gas. And when we burn any of those, those sources of fossil fuels, we give off carbon dioxide as a byproduct. So this graph shows actually how we've been producing um, carbon dioxide, which is the orange colored part of this plot, but also some other greenhouse gases over the last few decades. And just to see the steady march of our emissions as economic activity picks up throughout much of the world. So CO2 is the most important greenhouse gas. Um, and there are others that we'll also talk about later. So one kind of quick note is that CO2 could also come from deforestation. So not just combustion of fossil fuels, but when we actually take areas that were previously forested and acting as sinks for carbon by having trees and other vegetation, when we, when we clear those areas often for agriculture, um, that releases the stored carbon into the atmosphere as carbon dioxide. And so that's that darker orange component to the graph. Um, methane and nitrous oxide are the colors in blue. And those are important greenhouse gases as well that have contributions due to human activity. Um, but the most important is carbon dioxide. Um, and it's important that we note, moving on, that that CO2 is unbalanced by sinks. So if we think about how much carbon dioxide we're releasing today, we can get into units of billions of tons per year. So you can see on this slide that nine, that GT, that's gigatons, which is a billion tons of carbon. So a truly huge number. Um, it's actually a closer to 10 gigatons per year now than nine. Um, but what happens when we, when we release all of that carbon by burning fossil fuels or by land use change? Well, most of it goes into the atmosphere. A large fraction of it is dissolved into the ocean surface. And there's also some amount that's taken up by plants. Um, but we are looking at a situation in which we cannot take up all of the CO2 by natural mechanisms as fast as humans are releasing it. So the excess is accumulating in the atmosphere um, where it leads to all of the impacts that we're so concerned about that are listed there and which we'll discuss in more detail as we move on. All right, so why do we care about carbon dioxide so much? Well, because of the greenhouse effect. So the greenhouse effect is, of course, something that we need on our planet. If we didn't have a natural greenhouse effect, our surface of our Earth would be uninhabitable because it would be too cold everywhere. So the fact that we have an atmosphere that can trap some of the sun's energy from immediately being lost to space is really crucial for life. Um, but when we emit more and more carbon dioxide to the atmosphere, we can enhance this greenhouse effect um, and so we're actually going to raise the temperature of the earth in response. Um, and so today we're seeing a major enhancement of the greenhouse effect due to enhanced con uh, concentrations of, of carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gases in the atmosphere. Um, and the basic mechanism by which this works is this idea of radiative balance. So the earth needs to stay in radiative balance, which means it has to ultimately emit as much energy back to space as it receives from the sun. And because the amount of energy that any planetary body emits is related to its temperature, in order to emit more energy, Earth's temperature has to rise. And so that's why we actually get a warmer surface temperature as a consequence of an enhanced greenhouse effect. Okay, so let's look at CO2 particularly in more detail. Connecting CO2 to, green to temperature is, a ghost, of course, as I said, through the fact that CO2 is a greenhouse gas. But what does that really mean? Because um, this term gets used a lot. So greenhouse gases have to do with the actual molecular structure of the CO2 molecule. And in particular, it's the fact that CO2 is a molecule that has three atoms, right? So, the, so it's a carbon atom and two oxygen atoms. And the ability to trap heat energy is characteristic of molecules that have three or more atoms in their structure because of the way that those molecules can vibrate and maintains heat. 
So if you look at some of the other and the two most prominent constituents of our atmosphere are nitrogen gas, which is N2 in this picture, and then followed by oxygen gas or O2. And those are both molecules that just have two atoms each. And so they don't have the ability to vibrate in such a way that, that holds in or retains heat energy. So they're not greenhouse gases. CO2 in contrast, H2O or water vapor and methane and of course nitrous oxide are all molecules that have three or more atoms and so they, they have this property of being greenhouse gases. So this kind of gets us into mentioning water vapor because this is often brought up by, by people who are a bit skeptical of the role of carbon dioxide in climate change or global warming. Um, it's true that water vapor is a very important greenhouse gas. However, its concentration in the atmosphere is a response to temperature. In other words, when you are warmer, you can hold more moist air and the opposite is true when temperature of the atmosphere cools down. And so its concentration is very much controlled by the changes in temperature that are being driven by CO2 and the other greenhouse gases. Um, and so as just a sort of simple summary statement, we can say that an important greenhouse gas is one that has this molecular ability to absorb, absorb heat energy very strongly, particularly in the particular wavelengths of energy where Earth is giving off energy that it's received previously from the sun. Um, but then what makes CO2 even more important as a greenhouse gas is the fact that it can stay in the atmosphere for a very long time. So we say that, that molecule has a long residence time in the atmosphere. Um, and that is in contrast to methane, which is a very potent greenhouse gas, but recycles very rapidly through the atmosphere. And so a typical molecule of methane is only staying in the atmosphere for a few decades, and it's hundreds of years for CO2, and in fact, to lower the concentration of CO2 once it's raised, we're talking about even longer time scales, tens of thousands of years. Um, and so we can actually refer to the global warming potential of these different gases by taking into account both their lifetime and their actual ability to absorb heat energy. Um, and that's how we come up with this global warming potential for any individual gas. So CO2 concentrations have been rising as we've burned all of these fossil fuels and changed our land use activities. And we can see the response that Earth's temperature is rising. So even people who are often skeptical of the connection between CO2 and temperature have a hard time disputing this basic fact that the Earth is warming um, because we can measure it, right? With weather stations all over the, the world now, I have a slide later that'll, that'll show some of the coverage. Um, and usually when we report temperature curves like this, we talk about measuring temperatures relative to some baseline. So for this, in this graph, for instance, we've taken the average from 1961 to 1990, and then asked whether the temperature in any year is warmer than or cooler than that average. Um, and that's why you can see this graph moving from negative to positive temperatures um, over here on the, the y-axis. And so we've warmed by about a degree Celsius um, since the middle of the last century. All right, so if it wasn't CO2, as some people try to claim, they might point to other reasons why they might try to suggest that the, this temperature change is going on that wouldn't be tied to human activities. But it turns out that all of the suspects that you could look at that control Earth's temperature aside from greenhouse gas concentration have alibis if you want to think of it that way. So if we look at the sun, for instance, we've been measuring solar output through satellites since the 1970s and indirectly for much longer than that. And we can actually see that while the sun goes through cycles of 11 years and some longer period cycles in terms of its output, um, we actually wouldn't expect to see any warming due to, the, due to energy changes from the sun. In fact, we would be seeing a slight cooling trend um, based on the, the changes in solar energy that we've re reconstructed over the last few decades. Um, if we think about some other natural cycles, while there is important variability in the climate system that happens for reasons other than atmospheric concentrations of CO2, things like the El Nino Southern Oscillation, for instance, um, that people hear about a lot when, you know, California is having a very rainy season, for instance. Um, those are things that often have very strong regional impacts, but what we're seeing is planetary warming um, that, that is very, very different in character. Um, and finally, sometimes what's been brought up are changes actually in the amount 
of energy that the Earth receives from the sun, not due to solar output itself, but through changes in the way that Earth is orbiting around the sun. Um, and while it's true that those things change, they happen over extremely long time scales. So we're talking about tens of thousands of years. Um, and also, if anything, we'd expect that it would be about time for us to begin to progress into the next ice age um, within the next few tens of thousands of years. So again, completely inconsistent with seeing this massive amount of natural warming, really, um, in an absolute sense over, you know, the centuries time scale. Um, so just to kind of back up some of those things, this is a plot of the solar variability that I just kind of mentioned. So you can see these, these solar energy cycles. So on the y-axis in this plot, the vertical axis talks about the amount of energy that's given off by the sun. Um, and these are just some different ways that we are measuring these values um, by satellite. And so you can see that this is a very cyclic measurement doesn't look anything like the global surface temperature measurement when we look at it now. Um, so if we actually go further into the past, we can see that before human activities started massively changing atmospheric CO2 concentration, um, Earth's surface temperatures do to appear to have tracked solar output very well, but effectively we've, we've hijacked um, this, this role for the sun by changing atmospheric CO2 so rapidly. So other natural cycles, this is actually kind of combining both the natural cycles and the orbital climate change bit into, into one example slide. Um, here and now I'm showing as an example of how climate can change naturally the ice age cycles, or we call them glacial cycles, um, in this case of the last 800,000 years. So this graph is showing on the, the top um, an estimate of surface temperatures on Earth changing around some baseline zero identified today. And you can see where we are is this very edge called the, in the Holocene. Um, and we are going in and out of major ice ages in this record. So very, very dramatic climate change. But interestingly enough, on the bottom of this graph, we can see that those changes in temperature corresponded quite well with changes in atmospheric CO2 concentrations, in this case reconstructed by looking at fossil air trapped in, in the ice and taking cores through those ice sheets. And so if anything, the fact that we see examples of climate change in the past give us confidence that CO2 is very important in helping to control global temperature. And we can even go very far back in the past. So you might hear some people say that if you go, you know, very back deep, far in time, there were intervals of Earth history where it was extremely warm and there were no humans around driving cars to explain that warmth. Um, and again, that's true, but something that we should be concerned about because we see a close correspondence between atmospheric CO2 being elevated and very warm surface temperatures on Earth as we move back through time. So this is a, a paper that some colleagues and I put together a few years ago that now is moving back into the millions of year time scale. So this is everything from when the dinosaurs went extinct um, 65 million years ago up until today. And this plot shows on the one hand, some temperature estimates, um, those green, red, and black lines. And then on next to it, the, all of the different gray bars and dots are showing various ways that we've estimated atmospheric CO2 levels, um, particularly looking at material preserved on the ocean floor. And again, we see a correspondence between high estimates for atmospheric CO2 and high temperatures. Okay, so summarizing again what I said about this idea of changes in the orbit, um, it is true that as the Earth orbits around the sun, over the long time scale, we do see changes in how this happens and that affects the surface climate on the planet, but it happens very, very slowly. So. The, this is just a nice little cartoon that summarizes some of these orbital cycles, which are also often called Milankovitch cycles after a scientist who first described them. I mean, there are three primary Milankovitch cycles, but again, if you look at the, the numbers beneath each of those things, we're looking at tens of thousands of years over which these cycles cause variations in the amount of energy re received at the surface of the Earth and how that energy is distributed. Um, and also because of our understanding of laws of motion, we're able to calculate this very effectively. So we know very well, moving back into the past and into the future as well, how orbital changes should impact the amount of energy received at the surface of the Earth. And, and we know clearly that this isn't something that 
could be driving our current climate change. All right, so a couple notes then about the scientific consensus. Um, you know, it, this is a, a nice little cartoon if you try to represent as a tree, um, climate scientists who are convinced based on the available evidence that global warming is happening and that it's driven by human activities, that would be all of the green leaves. And the red are climate scientists who would say that they're not sort of convinced. And based on the evidence, right, the summary point is that the vast majority of practicing climate scientists would say, yes, the climate's changing and it's primarily driven by human activity. Um, and in any case, I like to make the side note that science isn't based off of the individual opinions of any, sci any given scientist. It's based off of the weight of the peer reviewed literature, what work is getting published. Because if there's a climate scientist out there who doesn't agree with the consensus of climate change, but none of their work is published and they can't cite any reproducible studies that they've driven that contests this point, then, then what they're doing isn't science anymore. And regardless of what degree that person has, it really is only relevant what's being published in the scientific literature. Um, and so I would say, you know, when you look on that basis, we're not even talking about 97%. We're, we're getting higher than that. There just aren't papers, peer-reviewed academic journals that are disputing the basic science of climate change. Um, and despite this, there is actually still persistent disbelief among the American public. I was kind of happy putting uh, some revisions through to these slides because the last time I, I showed this, um, the numbers were slightly lower. So I went back to the Yale Climate Communication Project website, which maintains these great graphs that show basically breaking down by state and also by different congressional district, um, their models of, of what surveys might show that people think about um, different aspects of climate change. So these are just some answers to some of the questions that they survey for. So overall, they would say that 69% of Americans believe climate change is happening. And that's actually up from the last time I had the, made this slide, it was 63%, so that, that's encouraging. Um, unfortunately, the numbers get lower if you start getting more specific. So it's only just more than half that believe that climate change is primarily caused by human activities. So they might say, okay, yes, it's warming, but how do we, not, how do we know that's not a natural cycle? Uh, what surprised me when I look at this is the fact that less than half of Americans think that most scientists think that global warming is happening. And that's the one that I, I would have hoped would have been the most, you know, the highest number because that is such a consistent um, opinion among practicing scientists. So I think that that's really key for volunteers to emphasize that, uh, that scientists are not in doubt about the basics of climate change and the warming planet. Um, so there's still a lot of inaccurate information out there, but, but there is uh, the silver lining or the hope is that these numbers are going in the right direction at least. Yeah, so I hope that there was like a glimmer of hope in that one chart that showed the two different projections for the end of the century based on human activities, because again, it, it really shows that we're not looking at a situation that's totally out of our control. We can have a huge difference in the amount of warming we see based on what we choose to do um, as a civilization in terms of our, our burning fossil fuels and how we power our economy. Um, so I'm gonna tell this what is a success story, which is that of the ozone hole. Um, so some people might remember this from being mass, really in the news a lot in the, in the 90s. Um, it hasn't been in the news so much these days, and that's actually, that's a good thing. It's because there's been improvements here. Um, so ozone is a very important molecule in our atmosphere. Um, it's formed by the interaction of uh, UV radiation with molecules of oxygen that can break and then, and then form and that give off an extra oxygen atom to form O3, which is ozone. And at any given time, the amount of ozone that we have available in the atmosphere, and in particular, we worry about it here in the upper atmosphere, is a balance between creation and destruction um, because it's also destroyed um, by, by solar, solar rays. So ozone is really important in, in terms of its atmospheric concentration because it can help block or protect Earth from UV, which is the very high energy solar radiation, which can cause skin cancers um, and is actually also destructive for, for um, not just humans, but for instance, photosynth photosynthesizing organisms in the ocean are very sensitive to UV light. And so ozone is significant for them as well. Um, and so something that we, we really rely on. And 
So then I, I'm not sure I don't know the, the details of when CFCs were first invented, but, but sometime in the last century, um, some very clever chemists and chemical engineers um, developed uh, molecules called chlorinated fluorocarbons for, that were extraordinarily useful for a lot of economic activity. So these were thought of as super molecules because they were these non-toxic for humans, they were non-flammable, um, they're propellants in aerosol cans, a lot of people know them for that use. Um, but they are used all over as solvents for dry cleaning, generating a number of different kinds of plastics and styrofoam. Um, and so really a molecule with lots of applications and they were cheap too, which was another really big benefit economically. Um, it wasn't discovered until considerably after they'd become infiltrated into so much of our, our economic activity that we realized that when CFCs break down in the atmosphere, which they do from interaction with ultraviolet energy from the sun, that they actually release chloride at atoms, which then go on to destroy ozone molecules. So they, they actually form a, a bond with one of the oxygen molecules in ozone, liberating the ozone molecule and releasing just oxygen gas. So that was a problem. However, there was immediate sort of global rallying behind the need to do something about this um, after the detection came out. And so this graph is showing the production of, of CFCs or the release of CFCs into the atmosphere. This is parts per trillion concentration of CFCs um, from the late 70s. And what happened is that we actually started discovering and measuring the ozone hole um, in the late 80s and almost immediately there was uh, something called the Montreal Protocol, which is a gathering of, of international governments, their representatives that banned CFCs. And you could see rapidly the concentration leveling off of CFCs in the atmosphere as a consequence, that the ozone hole has begun to recover as a consequence. So here you have some, some pictures that also includes a model of what projections are for ozone in the atmosphere based on the current rate of recovery. And since reaching kind of a, a minimum, we, we are actually beginning to see some, some recovery. And we expect that that'll happen um, really fully by, by sort of the later part of the century. But it's, I think it's important to note that this was an example of a, of a chemical that was being widely used and emitted to the atmosphere because it was cheap and because it had a lot of, um, a lot of beneficial uses. And yet pretty rapidly, governments were able to acknowledge that it had a negative side um, and do something about it. And we're seeing improvements based on that rapid activity. So I like to just use the ozone hole as a story to people who say, well, this is such a big problem that we'll never be able to do anything about it. And why should we even bother? You say, no, there's precedent. We, we shouldn't be you know, nihilistic about it. We could actually, we could take action and have an effect. Um, yeah, okay, so I guess, you know, this is just our, our kind of summary side of hopefully some of the major points. I know there's a, a lot of things that I, I kind of went into, get little snippets of lots of different topics, but, you know, hopefully everybody feels here confident to explain to everyone that carbon dioxide is a greenhouse gas, which means that it can trap heat energy. We know that the concentration of CO2 is rising and we can distinguish that CO2 as being from human activities not just because we understand that certain human activities release CO2, but also because we can chemically measure the CO2 that's, that's going into our atmosphere. Um, you can also hopefully say to anyone at this point, your confidence that scientists as a whole, um, which we can reflect through what's getting published in the peer reviewed literature, are, are really on board with the basic physics and, and, and chemistry of climate change. Um, and that it's due to human activities. We debate the details endlessly, um, but the sort of fundamentals are, are really very, very well settled among the scientific community. Um, and hopefully, you know, when you talk to anyone about all of the, what is unfortunately a lot of doom and gloom and very serious consequences, you can also stay, you know, kind of on a, a positive upbeat message, which is that one, we can massively change the amount of warming that we get by the end of the century by curtailing our CO2 emissions today. Um, and two, that there are examples of how human activities um, have been curtailed when they destroy the environment that then you know, turned around the situation. Both Dr. Kirtland Turner and I wanted to highlight a couple of resources about using Google Scholar.
Um, but one big thing that is available out there for any of you to use to find out more about the climate science research that's going on in your neck of the woods, you can see here a resource called Google Scholar. It's just scholar.google.com. You can search for any keywords or even put in key cities that you might be close to or questions that you have upon following up tonight. And all of this should cue specific research that you have available. Oftentimes it's available in public access in PDF form. You can search by climate scientist. You can click and find out their contact information even from these. You can actually read the articles and the documents here so that this isn't some elusive process, but you can be involved in the scholarship as well. We wanted to make sure to highlight that. I did want to let you know that outside of tonight's webinar, there's a really short uh, resource list that we thought would be really helpful to pre uh, prepare your own communications on additional questions or things that you would like to follow up on. And these are all hyperlinked in the slide deck tonight, and we can send this out to the team afterwards as well. Uh, but again, I'll put that in the chat window on where to find it. It's just our laser talks. There's several that are just to do with scientific messaging. There's a wonderful blog, Skeptical Science, and another blog that Gavin Schmidt, uh, who runs the Goddard Space Institute, realclimate.org also has. And we'll just also close. Um, I think part of the compelling uh, story that Sandy has told tonight has to do with the visuals that are available too. And for folks to really uh, imagine the impacts that we're experiencing and see the long time horizons. Oftentimes, visuals come very handy in, in being able to represent that. So there's another website that, that if you're interested after tonight, uh, here is the contact information for both Dr. Kirtland Turner and myself. It's just sandra.kirtlandturner at UCR, University of California, Riverside.edu. And then mine is brett at citizensclimate.org. Here is the website where the slides and the video recording will be uploaded again to tomorrow. Um, but let's open it up for questions again. And I'll just close before doing that and saying thank you all for being on the line. It's an honor to work with each of you in your climate advocacy. And we really appreciate you taking the time to be on the call tonight. Thank you, everyone. Yeah, thank you.